have your Bibles this morning, take and open them to the book of John. John's Gospel, if you would please. John chapter 21, as we're be in our text will be in John chapter 21. We'll be looking at some other passages and places. But John chapter 21, thank you guys and, and gals for all the music this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. And praise God. Now John chapter 21, of course, is to give you a little bit of background real quickly here. And then we'll look at some other background before we get started. Uh, this is after the resurrection of Christ. He's already gone to the cross, crucified, buried, and risen again. And now he's uh, showing himself to those 40 days uh, around to everyone and all the infallible proofs of his out. He's now, uh, the passage we're going to be reading, he's now back out at the Sea of Galilee. And uh, the boys have gone back to fishing. You remember Peter was a fisherman. And Peter had a business, the fishing business. Him and Peter, James and Andrew and John and them were all partners in the fishing business. And that's when Jesus first met them fishing and told them to come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And that's exactly what they did. And for the next three, three and a half years, they spent their life with Christ following Jesus. Those 12 apostles, the disciples that were the apostles, his disciples, and so forth. And now we come to this passage of Scripture, and uh, we find that uh, Peter has gotten discouraged. Peter has gone aside, and now he's back out in the boat fishing with six other guys that were in the group. And uh, all of a sudden, John recognizes the Lord on the seashore, tells Peter it's the Lord, and Peter dives out of the water and makes a beeline for the shore, for there is Jesus. Amen. And so that will help you a little bit. But then we're going to talk a little bit more about this Peter. Today we're going to look at, we've been looking through a series on being transformed. Transformed by the power of God. Transformed by the power of the gospel. How many of you have had a transformed life through an experience of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You've been saved and gloriously transformed by the power of God. You've been gloriously saved and transformed by His grace. How many of you have experienced the wonderful, marvelous, saving grace of God? Well, God's grace just doesn't save us. It does more for us than just that. God's grace is His unmerited favor towards us uh, now and throughout all eternity. Amen. God's grace is not limited, nor does it run out. Okay? Amen. Nor is it conditional. And so we thank God for His grace. And there is the grace of transformation. How many have been in a time, and you know someone, or even in your own life, you were saved uh, by the marvelous grace of God? Somewhere back in your time, think about it, when you got saved and you met the Lord, and God's grace saved you, and as time went by and years went by, uh, you kind of drifted away. Anybody been there? You know, we call it sometimes, like to call it backsliding. And that's okay, that's all right. Uh, and you've wandered away from the Lord. You're, you're not as active as you used to be. You're not as attentive as you used to be in attendance. You're not serving, you're not giving. I mean, the list could go on and on uh, once, what you once were. And, and you've kind of drifted away from that and you've fallen away from that and maybe even gotten totally out of fellowship with the Lord. Still saved, but out of fellowship. Still saved, but no longer walking with the Lord. Still saved, but no longer doing what you once did in the beginning. How many of you ever been like that? Huh? Come on, raise your hand. Be honest, be truthful this morning. Okay, we've all been there. And aren't you glad that God's grace Amen. spoke to you again, drew you back into the fold, Amen. called you back? Amen. And there's many that are watching by Rumble and Facebook and YouTube and television and everything that are in that same path. Now there are those that teach you can fall from grace and lose your salvation. Well, I disagree with that and I do not believe the Bible teaches that. Okay? Uh, but I do believe you can get out of fellowship with the Lord. I believe you can quit walking with the Lord. I believe that even a believer can turn away from the Lord. Matter of fact, do you realize that every person in here, I don't care how solid you are in your relationship with Christ, how spiritual you are, you're only three steps away from failing. You're only three steps away from falling. Every one of us, including me. 
And we're going to take a look at our wonderful Peter here. Uh, we've been looking at the transformation of the gospel, a transformed life, the transformational power of Jesus Christ. And here we're looking at the grace of transformation uh, in the life of Peter. So let me give you a little bit of background about how many of you remember about Peter. Peter's a big, tall, choleric fisherman, the one that's always opening up his mouth. Right? Peter got gloriously saved that day when Jesus said, come and follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And we can go back and, and find that passage of Scripture. And we find that Peter confesses in Luke chapter 5 and verses 1 through 11. So turn there for just a moment with me. A little bit of background of Peter. So we get in here, Luke chapter 5, if you would, verses 1 through 11. We find Peter here and we find in, in chapter 5 of Luke. Everybody in Luke chapter 5? Luke chapter 5, yes, very good, we're getting there. Luke chapter 5, verse 11. And we find that the Lord comes to him in the beginning of the chapter, and he finds them there, and they're fishing, and they fished, and their nets, and their ships, and, and the Lord enters into the ship, and he tells them, let's go out a little bit further, and he begins to teach the people as they sit down in the ship. And when he's left now, he tells Peter and them, now you've got to understand, this is the daytime, okay? And they've been fishing all night, and they're professional fishermen, and they haven't caught anything. So the Lord comes, gets in his boat, and says, launch out a little bit further from the shore here, uh, Peter, so I can teach the mass of uh, people that are flocking on the shore here. And he does, and then when he finishes his teaching, his preaching, his message, he says, Peter, let's launch out into the deep and cast your net. Well, first of all, you don't catch fish out in the deep part of the lake. They're caught around the shores and the shallows and so forth. And we don't catch fish in the broad daylight in the middle of the day. Right? But nevertheless, that thy word will do it. And he went out, and of course you know the story. They caught so much fish, their nets were breaking, they couldn't get it, they were about to fall over. And then pick it up with me in verse 8. The ship begins to sink in verse 7. And in verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Are you with me? Amen. Verse 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. See, two steps there in coming to Christ. First of all, one must confess that they're a sinner. And that they've sinned against the holy and righteous God. That's what Peter did. Then the second thing, the Bible says we must confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. That's how one gets saved. So, and then, you see, as a result of getting saved, the saved person wants to follow Christ. Amen. That's what the Holy Spirit puts in us. So here's this big fisherman now. He gets saved. He's going to start this wonderful journey of faith. And, and through his uh, uh, life, we see how much he does over in Matthew chapter 16. We won't turn to there. But verses 13 through 16, they're preaching and teaching and so forth. And Jesus comes and asks them there. And he says, uh, he says Whom do men say that I am? Well, some say, that ought a prophet, that ought Elisha, that ought Elisha, and you're this or that. And then he looks at them and he says, okay, men, whom do you say that I am? So here's this great fisherman, choleric fisherman in temperament, and has come to Christ, and he opens up his mouth and says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. What a confession from this man that's saved. He experienced saving faith, didn't he? And salvation. And then we get over into John chapter 6. Turn over to John. In chapter 6, Jesus uh, reminds them at the, about the bread that their father had given them in the wilderness. God had fed them with bread, manna from heaven. And Jesus said, no, I am the true bread. I am the bread of life. And I have come down, and if you will eat, partake of this bread, you'll have eternal life, everlasting life. He's teaching in chapter 6 doctrine. He's teaching solid Bible doctrine about eternal life and how it comes through that Jesus is the bread of life. Not that manna you ate in the wilderness, that wafer. I am the true bread of life that has come down from heaven, that God has sent me. And if you will believe on me, I will give you eternal life, everlasting life. He's teaching doctrine. And let me tell you something right now. Doctrine divides. Doctrine divides people. And the Bible says in these last days, Paul writing to young Timothy, that the time will come. And by the way, brother Paul, the time has already come. When they will not endure sound doctrine. 
They'll not bear up under sound doctrine. But they'll go after teachers and teaching, having te for the tingling, teaching their ears, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. Amen. That's what the Bible says. And we're in those last days. It's called the days of apostasy, the abandonment of the faith. Okay? And so he's teaching them doctrine here. Uh, look at verse 60 with me. He was teaching this in verse 59. He was teaching this doctrine in the synagogue. In, the, in verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Talking about him being the bread of life from heaven and giving eternal life. That major doctrine in the Bible. This is a hard doctrine of who can, who can hear it. Right? And, so, and then, so when Jesus knew it in himself that the disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? It's interesting that sound biblical doctrine offends people. What then if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up uh, where he was before? He said, what are you going to do when you see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? <laughs> It is the spirit that quickeneth in the flesh and profiteth nothing worse. But I speak unto you, they are the spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew that from the beginning that there were those that believed not and who would betray him. Then he said, therefore, I say unto you that no man can come unto me except to be given unto him of my father. Now watch this in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Are you with me? Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon, here's another confession from Simon. I'm trying to show you the life of Simon. All right, first he confesses, and Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, then, then, then he confesses, and here he says, Then Simon answered and said unto him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe that and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now here's a man that experienced saving grace. Here's a man who was gloriously saved, filled with the Spirit, of serving God, witnessing for God, speaking out for God for nearly three years. And now we come to John chapter 21. Christ has been crucified, buried, risen, and now proven himself going around. And he comes and finds these guys out. Now you remember what happened. They doubted. They ran for fear of their lives. Then he shows up in the room with them that day. Then eight days later, he shows up with Thomas. And then even after that, Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to the business. I'm going back to doing what I was doing. Chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, now you remember they came to the net and Jesus and Simon got out of the boat and ran. Here's Jesus. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, now remember what took place in Peter's life. We'll get to that in just a minute. Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, uh, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lamb. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. Now he's getting up, up tight a little bit. Because he said unto him a third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Let's pray together. Father, how we do thank you. We do praise you. We thank you for your glorious time together. Thank you for your word now. We want to give you all praise and glory and honor unto you, Father. May your Holy Spirit now be our teacher and our guide as he'll guide us into all truth. Bring to remembrance the things Jesus has said to us. Father, laid on our hearts. May you guide us and direct us, and we'll thank you for it. And we ask that the Holy Spirit now will give us illumination, understanding of the word. Help us to apply it to our lives and to others as well. And just to give some real thought on this as we think today concerning your word and your marvelous transforming grace in the life of every person. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the question is, 
What happened to Peter of those three and a half years in these great confessions of faith, following Christ, living for him, testifying to him, to three steps away? What happened? Jesus is crucified. He's buried. They're all run and hid. The Lord has showed himself to them three, twice since then, after the resurrection. And Peter goes back to the business, back to fishing. You see, I want you to see real quickly uh, the reason why Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter had to give a reply three times. Because remember what happened to this great fisherman? And this may be where you're at. How many of you believe Peter was still saved? Uh, Peter was saved and knew the Lord. But what happened? Do you remember in Luke chapter 22, 54? Then took him them and led him and he brought him to the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. The three denials of Peter. Three steps in your life and in my life of getting away from the Lord. Three steps from not following Christ any longer. Three steps from not serving and being involved and doing what we should do. It's real simple. It's real easy. You begin to follow the Lord afar off. Other things begin to take your interest and your time and so forth. And, and, and it's easy for any of us and all of us to do that. He followed the Lord afar off. Well, you see, three steps. One step leads to the next. That's why Jesus said, do you love me, Peter? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? By the way, when Jesus asked that, he asked it in the agape language. He used the word agape. Peter, do you love me with a agape love? Peter answers, I love you as a brother. He used the word phileo. We get our town, Philadelphia, the brotherly love. The second one. In Luke 22, as we follow along in the test in the passage, if you looked at it, verses 55 through 57, and when they had kindled in a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him uh, as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know not the man. Now he was ashamed to identify with Christ. How many believers do you know and even yourself in times you've been ashamed to identify with Christ? In the workplace, at home, at work, in the job, wherever you're at, where, 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 whoever you're around, you're afraid to speak up and to speak out. And, and, and at once you were a mouthpiece for Christ. Now all of a sudden you're following the Father off. Now all of a sudden you're ashamed to even identify as a believer with Christ and to identify with his name. You see, every one of us is capable of doing this. Then in, in, you read on in Luke 22, 60, 62, and Peter says, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked unto, uh, upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. You know what Peter needs? He needs another transformation of God's grace. From a guy that proclaimed him to be the Son of God, the, the, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, uh, the Bread of Life, the Truth, the Doctrine. And you remember in the Lord's Supper even that night, he says, I'll die for you. I don't care what the rest of these guys will do. I will give my life and die for you. And now he won't even stand up to anything, to a little old maiden saying, hey, you were one of them. Not me, I don't know him. I follow the far off. I've drifted. Now he denies Christ completely and even uses profanity. What happened? Did he fall from grace? No. Did he lose his salvation? No. But he needs another transformation of grace. He's backslidden. He's gone away from the Lord. And there's a lot of people like that today. And you need another touch of God's transforming grace. Let God's grace transform you. Remember, this was all after he was saved, by the way. So let's look real quickly. Let's take a look at it very quickly. Grace pursues me and you. Aren't you glad, church, that grace pursues you? Even when you backslide, even when you get out of fellowship with the Lord, even when you're not walking with the Lord, even when you're walking afar off from the Lord, even when you're uh, 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 far away, even when you're ashamed to identify with Christ because of where you're at, the pressure, the job, the work, the situation, whatever the circumstances, and you even come to a place where you just even deny, don't even know him. What happened to Peter? Same things that happens to you and I 
and can happen, we can do the same thing. And we do, but maybe not as drastically. And we need, and aren't you glad that, hey, God, now remember, now we go back to how does grace pursue? Remember where we're at now, all right? He's done showed himself twice in the house to him, all right? Peter's gone out and gone fishing. He said, it's all over, it's done with, I'm going back to the business, I'm going back to my interest, my hobby, my work, my man, my blah, 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 and so forth. And John says, hey, Peter, that's the Lord on the shore. Grace is about to knock on Peter's door. Hello. See, God wasn't going to give up on Peter. God won't give up on you and I either. You may fail, you may falter. He failed. He failed miserably three times. And you may fail and falter, but God's grace isn't going to give up on you. Thank God it's unlimited grace. Thank God it's 24 hours, seven days a week, year round, around the clock, for now and for all eternity is the grace of God. You may be in that situation that's watching by television or on the internet right now, the YouTube or Facebook, and, and you've messed up, you've failed miserably, you think, and you're away from the Lord. I want to tell you something. God's grace is pursuing you today. Thank God for his pursuing grace. Oh, God's transformational grace. He wants to pursue you and I. And how do I know that? It's personal. God's grace is personal. Aren't you glad? It's not just universal. It's personal, church. Do you remember uh, there, number one, if you're following along, uh, the angels, uh, when the, the angels saw the ladies come to the tomb, they said, hey, go tell his disciples that he has risen and he will meet you in Galilee and be sure to tell Peter. It's personal. Now when they meet here on the seashore, Jesus talks to Peter personally. See, God's grace is personal. Aren't you glad of that? And by the way, from this time on the seashore here, I'll, I'll bring it up later, but just so you can think about it. When's he going to get to it? From this part right here in the passage we just read, 20 days is going to pass. Jesus is going to go back to glory in 10 of those days real quick, we like. Okay? Then we're going to have Pentecost, which was 50 days after the resurrection. And you remember what happened at Pentecost? We'll get there in a minute. All right, so God's grace is personal. And that's why I'm so glad it's personal. Now, Cheryl, let me tell you, if you're not saved and you don't know the Lord and you've never been saved or born again, God's grace is personal to you because Jesus says to you this morning, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's God's personal saving grace. But what about to you and I? Here's the one I like. Being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you. See, when you got saved, God began a good work in you. And will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Peter, God began a good work in you the day you got saved back in the beginning in Matthew 5. All right, amen, or whatever we were at there. God, in Luke 5, God began a good work in you. You think it's all over and done and finished because you failed three times. You even cursed. You didn't even know the man. But God's grace is not finished with you, people. Peter, God's going to complete whatever he started in you. And so same for you and I, folks. It's not over yet. Thank God. I like to call this sometimes the God of a second chance. The God of a third chance. Anybody here need a second chance or you've already had one? Anybody here need a third chance? And guess what? You'll get that one too. Because God's grace is never ending. God's grace will always pursue you. And then it's personal. And by the way, God's grace is persistent. Aren't you glad God didn't give up on Peter? Amen. Hey, Peter, you denied me. You fell far off. You, you were ashamed of me. And then you even cursed me that you didn't even know me. Forget you, bub. Aren't you glad God's grace doesn't give up on us? Even when we mess up? And God's grace is persistent. Man, he pursued Peter for those three years, and then he died, and he comes back <laughs> and resurrects from the grave, and Peter's gone off on God's what? God's grace is still pursuing after Peter. Oh, thank God Jesus still was persistent after Peter. You see, God's grace, church, keeps on reaching and reaching and reaching out. It keeps on seeking you and I, no matter where we are, what's happened in our lives. It's not over, church. God's grace is fantastic. As a matter of fact, in this persistence now, you remember what Jesus does now. Now in the story here, Jesus begins to ask Peter a question. And he asks him the same question three times. Because how many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. So fair is fair, right? 
Peter, the first question he says in God's grace is, is the question of love. See, God says that to you and I. We've wandered away from the Lord. We've wandered far. We've backslidden. We've gotten away from Christ. We're not living for him anymore. We're not doing what we used to do. You know, all those kinds of things. And we wonder, and I want to tell you something, God's grace will pursue you. God's grace will be persistent with you. And the question he, God's going to ask you is the same thing. He asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Amen. After all of that, Peter all he was more concerned about, do you love me, Peter? And again, Jesus asked him that, and uses the Greek word agape. Peter, do you love me with agape, with a God love? With all your body, might, soul, and strength and everything. Do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, yeah, you know I love you. He had to respond. And he said, yay, Lord, I phileo you. Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Peter answers back and says, Lord, I phileo you. I love you as a brother. In other words, hey, man, we're good. You're my bud. You're my buddy. You're my pal. That's not what God wants. Peter, do you love me? In Philippians, Paul puts it this way about his life. He says, but what things? See, when, lovest, when he asks the question, lovest thou me, watch the Greek verb here, more, than these. Peter, do you love me more with, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, more than these? Now, he wasn't talking about just these men that are around you, your friends, but he's talking about your business. You're back fishing again. Do you love me more than your business? Do you love me more than money? Do you love me more than possessions? Peter, do you love me more than anything else? Am I first in your life? Do I have first priority in your life, Peter? I want to know as a true disciple, how much do you really love me, Peter? Paul says, but these things were gained to me, though I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Then he comes back a second time, and he asks him again, Peter, lovest thou me? Agape me. Peter comes back and said, Lord, phileo you. Yeah, man, I told you, you're my bud. We're pals, we're buddy, you're my bud, man, we're good. See, there's the question of value. He was trying to get Peter to see, well, Peter, am I worth more to you than your business? Am I worth more to you than your boat and your nets and your fishing business and your money you're going to wake from the business? Am I worth more to you than, than everything else that you have? But what, what's your value that you place on me? Am I the Lord God of your life? And do you love me with all your heart, body, mind, and soul? Or am I just your bud? You know, we're just pals. We're buddy. We're good, God. We're good. It's a question of values. Jesus, look what Jesus had to say about that. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 13, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. By the word mammon, there's the word money. Now, I know people, I've met people say, oh, I can do both. No, you can't. Because to, see, to say that you can do both is to call God a liar. Amen. What did the Bible say? God's word says you cannot serve both. You either hate the one or the other or cleave the one or the other. But you cannot, God says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I've had many tell me, oh, yes, I can. I can do it, blah, 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 and so forth. Yeah. Well, God says you can't. Peter, I know you messed up. I know you failed miserably. I know you followed afar off. I know you denied me. You were ashamed to even identify with me. And then the fact you didn't, that you denied me completely and even cursed. I've always wondered what was cursing like in Bible days. Do they use the same words we use today? Or should I, well, I'm going to say the same words that some of you use. Ah, I wonder, wonder what they were. Because where did all these cuss words come from? We know. Somebody had to invent them, right? So you see, God's grace is pursuing Peter. He's personally coming after Peter again, his grace. He's persistent with it. Peter, you see, when, God, when somebody does something three times, that's persistent. Peter, do you love me, boy? Peter, son, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? I just want to know. Tell me. 
Do you love me with all your heart, body, mold, soul, and strength? How much do you love me? How much value do you place on me in our relationship, Peter? Colossians says Christ wants to be the preeminent one in your life. He wants to be first in your life above everything else. It's not that all these other things are bad or wrong within themselves and that we can have them. No, but we're not to put them first and we're not to worship them. We're not to honor them. You see, we're not to place a great deal of value on them. So grace pursues, and thank God grace pursued in our lives as well. Amen? Amen. Some of us here before you today are the the results of God's second manifestation of grace, transforming grace in their lives. I'm glad God pursued me. I'm glad God's grace continued to pursue me and pursue after me and be persistent with it. Or I would not be here today if it was not for the grace of God. Grace proves, grace is going to prove our love and loyalty for Christ. We read that, and and it's a proving of his love. That's why he asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? See, the proving of his love, and the definition is, is, do you love me deeply? How deeply do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Mark 12, 30 says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God, talk to me, church, with all thy, and with all thy, and with all thy, and with all thy, This is the first commandment. Peter, do you love me with those four things? Do you, Peter? Lovest thou me more than these? Then he says, all right, Peter. I I know you got an understanding of this thing, but now I need an affirmation of it. You need to give me an affirmation. And so he asks him three times, and Peter answers him three times. The third one a little reluctantly, though. He says, thou knowest I love you. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. All your material possessions will burn up one day. They're all temporal. There's no eternal value to them. Only what's done for Christ is what lasts. We have but one life to live for him, and what we do with that one life for him is the only thing that's going to last. It's the only thing that lasts for eternity is eternal. And so Paul instructs us here in that passage of that verse in Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Well, then you see when grace comes along and it proves our love and we do, it's by definitions, by affirmation, then there's the proving of his labor. Peter, if you really love me, what are you going to do? You're going to feed my lambs. Peter, if you really love me, you're going to feed my sheep. Peter, if you really, really love me, feed my sheep. See, there was the proving of his love. There was the proving of it by his labor. By his labor. When he feeds my lambs, that's the little people. That's the junior boys and girls and little toddlers and so forth. And that's the babies in Christ that have just been saved. They're considered little lambs. Then there's supposed to be the more mature group. That's most of us in here. You're the sheep. Bah. Want everybody together now. Bah. Bah. Uh, oh, man, you all sound fantastic. Yeah, this is awesome. Sheep of the shepherd, of the pasture, praise God. Our labor. Listen to what 1 Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. The elders which are among you. Now that's another term and used for the words pastors, shepherds, okay? I exhort whom am, who am also an elder, Peter, a pastor, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being an example to the flock. 
And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. I'm looking forward to that. That's why I've got to keep the right heart, motive, and attitude. And you know what? You've got to stay faithful at it. What does God require in a steward? That he be found faithful. It didn't say that God requires a steward to be successful, but to be faithful. And he said, if you'll be faithful over a few, hallelujah, I'll make you ruler over many. And what does God require of man? Three things. That he do justly. Let's do what's right. That he love mercy. That's compassion. And that he walks humbly before thy God. That's what God requires of you and I. So this wonderful, and, and you say, well, I, I, I don't know if, uh, if, if, if any of that works right or not. And, and so uh, did, did, did Peter prove his labor of the second chance of grace? Well, yeah, he did, because I'll show you that in just a second, man. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. All right, lastly, real quickly, grace prompts. See, when, when, when God's second chance of grace comes our way, it's going to prompt us. And the Spirit of God's going to prompt our hearts. And you know what the first thing it's going to prompt us to do? Because what did God tell Jesus, Peter here to do? What did Jesus say to him? Peter, if you really, truly love me, then do what? Get to work. Labor. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. That's work. That's labor. Amen? So the Spirit of God prompts us, you see, because he was doing all that in the beginning, was he not? He was the great spokesman. I mean, he he was the choleric and temperament above all the guys. They looked to Peter as the leader of the group. He was the leader of the band, you know, that Italian band, (laughs) Jewish band. Amen? Amen? And then, wow, what happened to him? Well, we looked at all that, what happened. And now he has another opportunity. He has another second chance of God's grace. He doesn't need saving grace. He's already got that. What he needs is a new transformation of grace in his life because of what he's gone through and what's happened. Can you imagine how he feels? The Bible said he went out and wept bitterly of what happened and took place. And now God says, come on, Peter. We got work to do, brother. I'm not finished with you yet. When I started in you, Peter, I'll finish it. Hello, hallelujah, what God started in me many, many multiple years ago, God's going to finish it by his grace, hallelujah. Glory to God. There's hope for everyone. Grace will prompt you to serve. You see, when you're a true disciple of Christ and you love him with all your heart, body, mind, and soul, it's going to prompt you to serve. In other words, to work for Christ, to serve for Christ. Listen to what this says. See, if Jesus was saying, Peter, if you love me, serve me. Peter, if you love me, serve me. In Hebrews chapter 5, it says this in verses 12 through 14. For when for, uh, for, when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again. Which be, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, the ABCs of the gospel, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Well, here he's talking about a baby in Christ. Amen. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, those that are mature, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So grace prompt Peter to serve again, to get back in line what he was once doing. Did that happen? Oh, absolutely. Turn over to Acts chapter 2 with me. This is just 20 days later from this passage where we're in here in John. 20 days later, look what happens after Peter gets this second chance of grace in his life. Everybody in Acts chapter 2? Come on, we're just about finished here. Wrap it up. Amen. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. We are just about wrap it up. We're doing good. We're doing great. Acts chapter 2. Everybody with me? All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. If we'll start in verse 22 for just a minute. Here's Peter. Now remember, this is the day of Pentecost. This is 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. This is 10 days after his ascension to glory, which in that 40 days he was on the lake here talking to Peter and them and told Peter, you're not done yet, Peter. I got work for you to do. If you really love me, Peter, you told me three times that I was your pal, I was your bud. You know, we're buddies. Okay, well, buddy, pal, go to work. 
Amen. Amen. He stands up on the day of Pentecost. Remember, they were to go to Jerusalem and wait till they'd be endued with power from on high. Ye men of Galilee, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel, that's the Jewish counsel, and foreknowledge of God, he ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Are you with me? Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Death couldn't hold him down. And then he goes on to use David as an example there. But then I want you to take a look at verse 36 through 38. Verse 36, he says, and Let all the house of Israel know, as surely that God hath made the same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what must we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized for every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then on verse 41, Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them 3,000 souls. How many of you think Peter got a second chance of grace? How many of you think Peter went to work for the Lord? You see, because he got a second blast of God's grace. Here he was out fishing in the boat thinking it's all over and it's done. And this is amazing. He's out fishing in the boat when he's already seen the resurrected Christ twice. And yet he's still having problems. Oh, my. Grace prompted him to serve, but grace will also prompt us to sacrifice. Back in our text, real quickly, look at 18 and 19. Back in John chapter 21, grace will prompt you and I to sacrifice. Peter, if you love me, you're going to have to sacrifice. Your time, your talent, your treasure. One of the things you're going to have to sacrifice is shame. Did you know that? Let's look at verses 18 and 19. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. Back to John chapter 21 now. Okay. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. When thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whether thou wouldest. You'd go wherever you want and so forth. But when thou, shalt, when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whether thou wouldst not. Now, he said, what's that talking about? Verse 19. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. Are you with me, church? Peter, you may have to sacrifice in loving me. It may cost you even your life. There will come a time when the hands are going to come and you're going to die a martyr's death. Now, whether he was killed, crucified in Jerusalem or Rome, scholars can fight and argue over that all they want to. Okay? Okay. Whether he was crucified upside down, they can fight over that as well, too, because the scripture doesn't say. All right? But Josephus and other first historic Jewish writers seem to imply that that was the death that Peter took. But you see, you may be shameful. Listen to what 1 Peter 4 says. If you be reproached, shamed, for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But now let none of you suffer as a murderer. Don't bring your suffering on yourself by murdering and being a thief or an evil or a busybody in other men's matters. But verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify on this behalf. You see, if we really love Christ and we're his true disciple, and we've had a shot of his second grace or third grace, whatever, we're not going to be ashamed of him. Peter was ashamed of him, wasn't he? He followed the far off. Then he denied he wouldn't even identify with Christ. He told a young lady, ah, I'm not one of them. I, I'm, not a, I'm in that, that group. Then the next one, he said, I don't even know that guy at all. Man, I don't even know this man. Blah, blah, blah. And blankety, blank, blank. Huh? Peter, you may have to sacrifice shame for me. See, loving Christ may bring shame to you. 
And then, he not only that, he said, Peter, you may have to the sacrifice of suffering. You see, grace prompts you and I to serve. It prompts us to sacrifice, to sacrifice shame. It prompts us to sacrifice of suffering. And as we read that in there, yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. See, Peter, because you truly love me now, you've had a second chance of grace here. Are you willing to suffer for me? Peter, are you willing to suffer for me now that we've met again, now that I've called you off the boat out in the lake again? Where did they meet him the first time? On the boat, fishing. Drop everything and follow me. And they did. Maybe you were following Christ in the beginning. You've wandered off. You've wandered afar off. Maybe you're ashamed to, to, to identify with him because of the, the group and who you're hanging out with and where you're going to take a stand for Christ and to openly confess that you're a Christian and that you know the Lord and you don't do those things, you don't participate in those things or whatever it may be. And then people, you know what, people are going to laugh at you. People are going to mock you. They're going to jeer you. They're going to ridicule you. See, they're going to try to shame you. And, Peter, and he tells Peter, Peter, are you willing to do that for me? Do you love me that much? Peter, I'm trying to get you out of a phileo love to agape love. Do you love me with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul at your inner being, and all your strength? Or am I just a, a bud to you? Just a pal. Ah, Jesus, we're good. The question is, Peter... Will you love me to the end? Because he told him in verse 18 and 19, this is the death you're going to die. And Peter loved him to the very end. Peter, do you love me with a serving, sacrificial love? Do you? Do you, Peter? Huh? Do you love me with a sacrificial serving love? Oh, aren't you glad of God's second blast, transformational grace that comes, that pursues us, that persists is after us? Aren't you thankful? I know I am. Maybe you've wandered far. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. Path I've trod. Huh? I'm coming home. Maybe some of you that are watching with us and still with us. Maybe you've wandered away from the Lord. You've kind of gotten backslidden. You've got off the path. You're not doing and serving and active and so forth like you once were or used to be wonder if God's grace is still available? Did you think maybe perhaps you've fallen from his grace and your salvation? No, my friend, not at all. God wants to transform your life again with his wonderful, marvelous grace. To get back in the saddle. <laughs> get back in fellowship. Get back and work with the Lord. And by all means, if you've never been saved, are born again, God wants to extend his saving grace to you. For we are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. You see. But then if you've messed up, oh, my friend, God's grace is right there as he did with Peter, no matter what or what's happened. He still comes to you and he says, listen, child of God, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? And you have a chance to do something about it. And aren't you glad Peter did respond? Amen. And Peter accepted that second life-changing grace of God. 
And did you know that three chapters later from Pentecost there, Peter got up again and preached and 5,000 men got saved? Scholars tell us between that and Pentecost could be as many as 25,000 people, counting women and children, came to Christ. Some have even gone farther than that. Peter got messed up again over in the book of Galatians. And he got over there with the Gnostics, the Hellenistics and the Gnostics of, of the doctrine of grace and grace alone. And, and they began to convince him that they had to be circumcised. A works salvation. And Paul writes him a letter and says, no, wait a minute. I need to come and get you straightened out. You need another shot of God's amazing grace. Oh, praise the Lord for God's grace today. I don't know where you're at in your life. and don't know what's happening, gone on in your life. Perhaps you feel like you can identify in this story today. Somehow, somewhere, someplace in it. Then let God have his way. His perfect will in your life today. There's always room at the cross. And there's always, you've wandered far, but now I'm coming home. Aren't you glad we can come home for the grace of God? And again, if you've never been saved, let us give you that opportunity right now. With heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Here in the auditorium, we're going to ask you to be praying. Praying for those that are watching right now by way of Rumble Live, Facebook Live. Those that will be watching it a little bit later on, right after the service, it will be loaded up again. And then later on during the week, it will be on radio and the television and everywhere around the world. Pray that God will use it to save souls. And pray that God will use it to help those who are struggling. And they feel like they're away from the Lord and they've wandered far away from God and their relationship and walk is not there. And they feel down, discouraged, and maybe hopeless. Pray for them as well, for the wonderful, life-changing grace of God. Now, friend, if you've never trusted Christ, let me encourage you to do so right now. We're going to pray and we're going to do what the Bible says to do. Now, it's not the prayer that saves you. Those are words communicating with God. What saves you is putting your faith and trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross of Calvary. That's what saves you. And so we're going to pray a prayer that's in the scripture. It's all biblical. And it goes something like this. We're going to ask you to pray with us. Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess with my mouth you are the Lord from heaven. That's what Peter did. I confess that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you, God. That's exactly what Peter did. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me and come into my heart and life and to be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you were buried and that you rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's Bible. And so right now, by faith, I do receive you, Lord Jesus, and invite you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die. I pray this simple little prayer in faith, believing in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.